Well, good morning, Redeemer. My name is Brian, and this morning we're going to be continuing our summer series in the Psalms, focusing on the theme of the Lord reigns. El, over the last two weeks, has preached on Psalm 51 and Psalm 21, and today we're going to be looking at Psalm 97. And as you find your place in your Bible or on your device, I'd encourage you to keep it open this morning because we'll be going back to it again and again. I want to start by thinking about reorienting your world, reorienting your world. That can happen in small ways. I've been at Redeemer now for four years, and I have a 32-ounce mug that I drink water from. I drink at least 32 ounces a day. And for the last four years, I've gone into the kitchen at Redeemer and gone to the water cool, and I've pressed the light blue button on the water cooler, and I've gotten lukewarm water. About two months ago, I walked into the kitchen, and I saw the water cooler, and I recognized that there are actually three buttons on the water cooler. I'm not very observant about some things. And the button on the left was a red button, and the button on the right was a dark blue button. And I was like, I wonder what happens if you push the dark blue button. Cold water, right? Who knew? I'd been drinking lukewarm water for four years, and finding the dark blue button reoriented my whole world, right? Or uh, reorientation can happen in movies, in, and I love a good plot twist, right? In a 2016 movie, Arrival, Amy Adams plays Louise Banks, and Louise Banks is a linguist. And when 12 alien spacecraft land scattered across the world, uh, the military summons Louise Banks to begin to communicate with the aliens. And so she begins to learn their language, and it's an unusual language. There are squiggles and splotches, but it always comes out in a circle. Their written language always comes out in a circle. It's a complete idea. They communicate all at once. There's no beginning and there's no end. And the movie develops an interesting premise, and the premise is this, that our language shapes the way we see the world. Our language shapes the way we see the world. And so as Louise Banks begins to learn this circular language, she begins to see the world circularly. It's no longer a linear chronological sequence of events, but now she sees the middle and the end and the beginning all at once. And here's the plot twist. The plot twist is that the movie is told from Banks' perspective. It's told all at once, beginning, middle, and end. And when you see that, it reorients the whole way that you see the movie. You go back and you go, oh, it was there all along. I just didn't see it. And so sometimes reorienting your world can happen in the movies. But maybe one of the most significant reorientations in our world happened in 1514 when Copernicus issued a little pamphlet. You see, for hundreds of years, society believed that the sun revolved around the earth. And Copernicus suggested that actually the earth revolved around the sun. And about a hundred years later, in 1610, Galileo figured out how to magnify his telescope to 30 times magnification, and he could see Venus, and he saw stages of Venus that could only be explained by Venus revolving around the sun. And within a hundred years, it was commonly, widely accepted that the earth revolved around the sun. It was called the Copernican Revolution. It was a paradigm shift. It completely reoriented the way we understand the universe. And that's what Psalm 97 is doing this morning. Psalm 97 is going to reorient the way you see the world. 
We're going to look at our passage this morning under two headings. First of all, we're going to consider in verses 1 through 5, the Lord reigns. And then in verses 6 through 12, we're going to consider our response. The Lord reigns, and then our response. And here's what I'm going to tell you this morning. The Lord reigns, reorients our world, and is a reason for the righteous to rejoice. Let me say that again. The Lord reigns, reorients our world, and is a reason for the righteous to rejoice. So let's focus our attention then on Psalm 97, starting at verse 1. This is the holy, inerrant, and inspired Word of God. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. His lightnings light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim His righteousness, and all the peoples see His glory. All worshipers of images are put to shame, who make their boast in worthless idols. Worship Him, all you gods. Zion hears and is glad. The daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord, for you, O Lord, are most high, Over all the earth, you are exalted far above all gods. O you who love the Lord, hate evil. He preserves the lives of His saints. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, and give thanks to His holy name. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the Word of our God stands forever. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, as we come this morning to consider this small phrase, the Lord reigns, I pray that we would see you high and lifted up, that we'd we'd see you seated on your throne, reigning in righteousness and justice. And Father, I pray that as we encounter that theophany of your presence this morning, that you would convince us of our sin and misery, that you would enlighten our minds in the knowledge of Christ, and that you would renew our wills by the power of your gospel through the work of your Holy Spirit and the mediation of your Son. I ask that you would forgive the one who teaches his sins, for they are many. May we see Jesus in him only. Amen. So first of all, let's consider this morning in verses 1 through 5, the Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. Our psalm begins with this short phrase, the Lord reigns. And whenever you see Lord in all caps in the Scriptures, it's the Hebrew word Yahweh. And that word Yahweh is a name of God that we get in Exodus chapter 3. And it's a scrunched up, condensed version of God's promise that He would be with His people. Yahweh means God with his people. And the Hebrew structure here in this phrase, Yahweh reigns, there's an emphasis on Yahweh. You see, it's Yahweh reigns, the psalmist is telling you. It's not someone else. It's not anyone else. It's Yahweh who reigns. It's a proclamation of Yahweh's kingship. Now, this exact phrase, Yahweh malach, Yahweh reigns, only appears four times in the entire Bible. And yet, it is designed to reshape and reorient our world. And those four times come right here in this grouping of Psalms. As you have your Bibles open, flip back to Psalm 93 and verse 1. How does Psalm 93 begin? It's, the Lord reigns. And then go to 96 and verse 10. And what do you see? 
Let, let it be said among the nations what? The Lord reigns. Yahweh Moach. Psalm 97.1 says what? It begins with what? Yahweh reigns. Yahweh Moach. The Lord reigns. Psalm 99.1 begins what? The Lord reigns. Yahweh reigns. And so these four psalms, along with Psalm 98, which mentions Yahweh as king, these four psalms, so now these five psalms, are called the Yahweh Malach Psalms. The Lord reigns. And David Howard, in his book, The Structure of Psalms 93 to 100, argues that Psalms 93 to 100, including these Yahweh Malach Psalms, are the structural center of the book of Psalms. Did you know that there are five books in the Psalter? You lose this on your app, but it's there in your physical Bible. Andre, if I can get that first slide. Book one is Psalms 1 to 41. Book two is Psalms 42 to 72. Book three is Psalms 73 to 89. Book four is Psalm 90 to 106. And book five is Psalm 107 to 100. And each of these books ends, concludes with a doxology. And Gerald Wilson says that there is an intentional arrangement to the Psalter. It's not your random iPod shuffle where order doesn't matter. Order matters. Context matters here. The arrangement of the Psalms is such that one Psalm being placed next to another Psalm, the redactor, the one who places those Psalms next to each other, is having those psalms speak to one another in the final form of the Psalter. So the redactor takes existing groups of psalms that are out there and individual psalms, and he puts them together into a final form. And that final form of the Psalter has a message. You can think of it like a quilter right? A quilter, any quilters out there, a quilter takes existing patches of material and stitches them together until you see one final quilt, and the redactor is putting the psalter together in one final book, and that book has a message. Well, how do you find out what the message of the Psalter is? Gerald Wilson says, well, if you want to see the quilter's handiwork, you need to look at the seams. You need to look at the seams. And he says Psalm 1 is an introduction to the whole Psalter. So the first Psalm that we have that's really a part of Book 1 is Psalm 2. Can I get that next slide, Andre? And he says that there's a covenantal frame, and that Psalm 2 is the institution of the Davidic covenant. And then at the end of book 2, Psalm 72, which is one of two Solomon songs, is the transmission of the Davidic covenant, as the Davidic covenant is passed from David on to Solomon. And then Psalm 89, at the end of book 3, looks at the apparent failure of the Davidic covenant. You see, at some point, it seems like in Israel's history, when there is no longer a Davidic king on the throne, when there is no throne, when Israel's people are in exile, it seems like the the covenant with David. It seems like the promises of God have failed. And so, what's the answer in book four? The answer in book four is Yahweh reigns. Because you see, sometimes when we find ourselves floundering in the darkness, it, sometimes it seems like the promises of God have failed. And when we find ourselves in that dark place, we need to be reminded, Yahweh reigns. And so Yahweh reigns is the structure, the structural center of the Psalter. Thank you, Andre. Now, James Luther Mays argues that not only is Psalm 93 to 100 the structural center of the Psalter, but it's also the theological center of the Psalter. In other words, 
get this, Yahweh reigns is the foundational truth that makes the whole Psalter make sense. Yahweh reigns is the foundational truth that makes the whole Psalter make sense. Think about this in terms of the different types of Psalms. There are different categories of Psalms, different types of Psalms. One type of Psalm is hymns, and hymns have a call to worship, and then they give reasons for worship. And those reasons for worship are usually based on the character of Yahweh. So why do we sing hymns in the Psalter? because Yahweh reigns. More than 60 of the 150 psalms are laments. And in laments, psalmists bring their complaints to God. And why do you bring your complaints to God? Because Yahweh reigns. And because Yahweh reigns, He can do something about your complaint. Or think about royal psalms, like Psalm 21 that Al preached on last week. They're focused on the king, right? The Messiah, the anointed one, and they rejoice in the king's justice and righteousness and kingdom. Why sing a royal psalm, especially when there's no king on the throne? Because Yahweh reigns, and a king is coming. What about wisdom psalms? Wisdom psalms tell us how we should live. Why should we live this way? We should live this… You're seeing the pattern at this point, right? I hope. Why should we live this way? Because Yahweh reigns. Or think about penitential psalms, like Psalm 51 that El preached on two weeks ago. Why should we confess our sins and repent? Because Yahweh reigns. In other words, in the Psalter, the people of God, the city of God, the King of God, and the law of God are all established because Yahweh reigns. We lament, we ask forgiveness, we cry out for help because Yahweh reigns. We exalt, we praise, we're filled with wonder and awe because Yahweh reigns. Yahweh reigns is the theological center of the Psalter. Without Yahweh reigns, there would be no Psalter. Without Yahweh reigns, the Psalter would fall apart. You can't overestimate the importance of this little phrase, these two words in Hebrew, Yahweh reigns. And then the psalmist begins to describe Yahweh's reign, and he describes God's presence which is also known as a theophany, right? A physical manifestation of God's presence on the earth. He describes God's presence, and as he does, he draws on imagery from from all throughout the Old Testament, from Isaiah 6 and Isaiah 40 to 66 and Habakkuk 3 and Exodus 19. And he's giving you this swirling kaleidoscope of images where God is on the, mount, the mountain of Sinai and he's giving his law, or he's high and lifted up on his heavenly throne, or he's giving grace to Israel, or he's bringing judgment to the nations. Psalm 97 is, it just reverberates, it's chock full of biblical language. For example, Can I get that next slide, Andre? In Deuteronomy 4.11, and here in Deuteronomy, Moses is speaking to the second generation Israelites on the plains of Moab, and he's giving them a historical prologue. This is everything that God has done for you as he's brought you out of Egypt and through through the wilderness to the promised land. And here Moses says, and you, as he's recalling Mount Sinai, He says, and you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain. Now, get this picture. While the mountain burned with fire, burned with fire to the heart of heaven, wrapped in darkness, cloud, and gloom. And I want to keep that up there and compare it to what we have in our passage this morning. So look first at verse 2. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Verse 2, we see that in Deuteronomy 4.11. He's wrapped in cloud and in darkness, right? And this cloud and darkness point to the great mystery and awe and wonder of the presence of God. 
And then look at verse 3 in your text. The fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. When Deuteronomy 4.11, the mountain burned with fire to the heart of heaven. This is a picture of God's judgment. God is a consuming fire in His holiness. And then look at verse 5 in our text. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord. And we have in verse, in verse 11, Deuteronomy 4.11, the mountain burned with fire right? Now, mountains were a picture of stability and security, but in the presence of God, they're melting like wax. Thanks, Andre. And if that picture weren't enough, you add to it in verse 4 a lightning storm, a thunderstorm. Look at verse 4. His lightnings light up the world. When was the last time you saw a thunderstorm? We had a good one on Thursday night, that the flashes of lightning, the rolling thunder. Now, that may not seem like much for us today in a world after electricity and after engines, but for an ancient person, before electricity and before engines, their world was relatively silent. And one commentator says that for ancient people, a thunderstorm was an awe-inspiring phenomenon. And it's possible that every thunderstorm, anytime you saw a thunderstorm, it was regarded as a theophany, as the physical manif manifestation of the presence of God. The thunder symbolized Yahweh's voice, and the lightnings, His arrows, and His spear. And to this thunderstorm in verse 4, add a volcanic eruption in verse 5, and the presence of God is shaking the world. One commentator puts it all together like this, God's person is hidden in the mystery of clouds and thick darkness. Irresistible fire precedes Him. Lightning and thunder manifest His power. And how does the earth respond? At the sight, verse 4, the earth sees and what? It trembles. And verse 5, the mountains dissolve. Can you feel the power of God's presence? Can you feel the power of this theophany, the immense unbridled power? But what's the shape? of this power? What's the nature of this power, right? Power can cut either way. Power can be good or power can be bad. What's the shape of the manifestation of the power of God in this theophany? Verse 2. Look at verse 2. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of His throne. What's the essence of Yahweh's reign? What defines Yahweh's reign? It's righteousness and justice. You see, Yahweh is about the business of bringing righteousness and justice throughout His kingdom. And righteousness has the sense of victory over darkness. Righteousness is God putting things right, right? He's bringing righteousness and shalom, this deep peace to His kingdom. And God's kingdom is an ethical kingdom. It's a kingdom of good over evil. And then justice. Justice is the application of that righteousness to society. And how does that happen? It happens through legal judgments and decisions. So righteousness and justice are the foundation of His throne. And these two attributes are what God's kingdom on earth is founded upon. Back in Psalm 72, the this psalm, this psalm of Solomon, where we have the transmission from David to Solomon, the first two verses of Psalm 72, Solomon prays this, "'Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice.'" 
You see, righteousness and justice create harmony in society. They bring shalom. They bring peace. They protect the weak. They restrain the strong. And when righteousness and justice are missing in Israel, the prophets come, and they call God's people to task. Remember what Micah says in Micah 6, 8? What does God require of you? To do what? To do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. And in fact, it's actually the absence of righteousness and justice that lead God's people into exile. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of His throne. And as you marinate in that truth, and you, as you marinate in Yahweh's righteousness and justice, when you see His power and the foundation of His throne, Yahweh reigns, takes on a whole new meaning. When we say Yahweh reigns, we're saying that righteousness will reign. We're saying that justice will reign. And we see this throughout the Psalter in Yahweh's roles as warrior and judge and benefactor and shepherd. He's a righteous warrior. He's a just judge. Yahweh is bringing righteousness and justice to the earth. And when that picture of Yahweh's reign lives in our sanctified imaginations, it doesn't just reorient your understanding of the Psalter. It shapes your whole world. You see, when there's a proclamation that Yahweh reigns in righteousness and justice, it demands a response. And your response will reorient your whole world. It will shape your mission, your identity, your destiny. It asks this question, do you belong to this kingdom? Or do you belong to another kingdom? What do you do with King Yahweh? Are you in or are you out? Are you for or are you against? Where does your allegiance lie? And that leads us then to our second part this morning. In verses 6 through 12, we see our response. So the declaration of Yahweh's reign in power and righteousness is a universal declaration. It's a universal declaration with a universal summons to rejoice. Look at verse 1. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. You see, it's the whole earth. It's a universal declaration and a universal summons. It's the whole earth that's invited to rejoice in this declaration that Yahweh reigns. And to explain that further, the psalmist continues, let the many coastlands be glad. And coastlands could be translated distant shores. The idea here of coastlands is it's to the ends of the earth. This is a summons to the ends of the earth to rejoice. And then look at verse 4 the earth sees and trembles. Again, it's not part of the earth. It's the whole earth. It's universal. And what do they see? They see that theophany of cloud and darkness, of fire and lightning. They see the expression of the power of Yahweh's reign. And what's their response there in verse 4? And they tremble. They tremble. Verse 6, the heavens proclaim His righteousness. It's a universal declaration. And all the peoples, verse 6, and all the peoples see His glory. You see, the psalmist is saying that everyone sees God's power and His glory and His righteousness. And this is what Paul echoes in in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. Paul writes, "...for His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse." And to this universal declaration and this universal summons to respond, there are only two responses. 
There are two responses, and there are only two responses. The first response is in verse 7. They're the worshipers of images, and the worshipers of images make their boast in worthless idols. What does it mean to make their boast in? When you make your boast in, you're putting your trust in something, you're building your life on something, you're finding your meaning from that thing. This is what defines you. It's where your allegiance lies. And they are making their boast in worthless idols. Instead of Yahweh who reigns in glory and power and righteousness, they're giving their allegiance to little impotent statues of wood or stone. But oh, brothers and sisters, we do this. We do it every day. We do it all the time. You see, these impotent idols aren't just idols of wood and stone. You see, an idol is really anything that you make your boast in, and you can make your boast in your accomplishment or in your family. You can make your boast in your career or your reputation or your wealth. What are you boasting in this morning? And what happens to these worshipers of images? It says, they are put to shame. And the verb put to shame carries the idea of humiliation and failure and ridicule and dishonor and loss of face. And they're put to shame because their idols can't help them. You see, if you're building your life on anything but the true and living God, it will always let you down. Only the living God can save you. Only the living God can satisfy the deepest longings of your heart. And did you notice the first word in verse 7? It's all. All worshipers of images are put to shame. In other words, if you're boasting in worthless idols, shame is inevitable. It may not come tomorrow or next week or next month, but it is coming. The psalmist is saying, if you're putting your trust, if you're boasting in worthless idols, that's how your story ends. It ends with shame. But the second response that we see in our text starts in verse 10, and it's those who love Yahweh. It's the lovers of Yahweh. And how do they respond to this universal declaration that Yahweh reigns and this summons to rejoice? Look there at verse 8. Zion hears and is glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoice. And why do they rejoice? Keep reading verse 8. Because of your judgments, O Lord. They're rejoicing because of God's judgments. Now, judgments is the same word that we've already seen in our text. Do you know where? It's back in verse 2, the word that's translated justice, right? When we saw that righteousness and justice are the foundation of His throne. So, why not translate it justice here? Why, Why translate it judgments? Well, because it's plural. And in English, if we say justices, we're looking for somebody who's sitting on the Supreme Court somewhere, right? So, so the translators here go with judgments. But judgment still carries the same idea of justice, right? It's still applying God's righteousness in the world. One of the blind spots in American evangelicalism, and it's one of my blind spots too, uh, it was for a long time. I have other blind spots now. I'm not sure what they are. If I did, they wouldn't be blind spots anymore. But one of the blind spots of American evangelicalism has been to think about the kingdom of God as something that is exclusively individual and spiritual. It's concerned really only with private, personal salvation. It's concerned with getting people to heaven alone. But it isn't terribly concerned with the injustice in the world. That's something for the civil magistrate. And I think that translations, English translations like this, feed that blind spot. 
And, and I'm not saying here that there's a better way to translate it. This is the best that we can do. But just remember, as you read your English Bible, whenever you see judgment, it has this, carries the same weight as justice. It's still applying the righteousness of God to society, right? Judgments and justice, it's the same Hebrew word. And so, lovers of Yahweh rejoice because of God's justice, verse 8, and they also rejoice because Yahweh reigns. Look at verse 9. This is essentially what verse 9 is saying, for you, O Lord, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Yahweh reigns. He's exalted over all the earth and over all gods. And these lovers of Yahweh, verse 10, are also described as saints, verse 10, and they're described as the upright in heart, verse 10. And then two times in verses 11 and 12, they're described as righteous. They're described as righteous. Why are they described as righteous? Well, Greg Beale has written a book entitled, We Become What We Worship. And he argues exegetically that as we worship idols, we become more and more like them. And as we worship the living God, we become more and more like Him. So, the psalmist calls these lovers of Yahweh righteous. Why? Because in verse 2, righteousness and justice were the foundation of Yahweh's throne. And as we love Yahweh, as we worship Yahweh, we become more and more like Him. We are conformed to His image. So, to the universal summons to rejoice in verse 1, lovers of Yahweh respond with rejoicing in verse 8. But now in verse 12, there's a command to the righteous to rejoice. Look at verse 12. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, and give thanks to His holy name. But if they've already responded by rejoicing, why this command to rejoice? Well, you see, rejoicing isn't a one-time act. It's not a one-time response. It's an ongoing pattern in the Christian's life. And why should we rejoice? Well, look at what God does for the lovers of Yahweh. In verse 10, He preserves the lives of His saints, and He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. He preserves the lives of His saints, and He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. So, Yahweh reigns doesn't mean that we have a blissful life without difficulties and struggles. You see, if the psalmist has to write that he preserves the lives of his saints, it implies that there are times that you will need your life preserved. It implies that there are times that your life will be in danger, that your life will be threatened. And when the psalmist says he delivers them from the hand of the wicked, it implies, brothers and sisters, that there will be a time when you will find yourself in the hand of the wicked, and you will need to be delivered. But in the end, the wicked will not finally prevail. You see, their end is certain. One day, on that last day, judgment will come, and everything will be set right. But in those times in between, in those seasons of distress, do you know what God is doing for the righteous? It's there in verse 11. Light is sown for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. And this is the divine passive. God isn't mentioned, but He's the one at work. God is sowing light and joy like little seeds, and He's watering them, and He's nurturing them, and they're growing. He's sowing light in the darkness. He's sowing joy in the midst of the despair. And that glimpse of the light in the darkness, when that light breaks through, you get a small taste 
of the kingdom of God in a world where wickedness and oppression still reside. And that glimpse of light brings just a hint of joy. And then hope begins to build as we wait, as we wait for the final demonstration, the fuller demonstration at the end of time for Yahweh's kingship on earth. You know, Jesus talks about the kingdom. He mentions the kingdom 124 times in the Gospels. He says kingdom of God 53 times in Mark and Luke, and the kingdom of heaven in 32 times in Matthew. And do you remember how he teaches his disciples to pray? He says, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Why is Jesus talking about the kingdom all the time? Because he is the king, and he's announcing that the king has come. You see, Jesus inaugurates the kingdom of God on earth, and when he came, we beheld His glory, according to John 1. And that glory recalls and echoes the power and glory and righteousness of Psalm 97. And with Jesus' death and resurrection, He brings the overlap of the ages, the now and the not yet, the first fruits of the new creation. The kingdom of God has come and is coming. We see it now only in part. But one day, we will see it fully. We will see it fully. And so, for now, we wait. And as we wait, we'll experience turmoil and trouble, disaster and disease and death. And oh, brothers and sisters, those are times to weep. We weep when we lose a brother or a father to senseless gun violence. We weep when we lose a father to COVID or to liver disease. We weep when the diagnosis is cancer or that a child won't be viable outside the womb. And so we weep because it seems like hatred reigns and it seems like violence reigns, and it seems like death reigns, it seems like disease reigns, and these are times to weep. But I want to sow a seed of light and joy. You see, there is a time that's coming when we can say with the elder in Revelation chapter 5, weep no more, Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that we can, he can open the scroll and we'll see the lamb standing as though he had been slain. And he'll go and he'll take the scroll from the right hand of him who is seated on the throne. And when he takes the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders will fall down and they will sing a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation." And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign over the earth. Do you see that? Because Yahweh reigns, Jesus reigns. And because Jesus reigns, one day when he comes back, right, we will reign. And how is it that we'll reign? John says in Revelation 19, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war, and his eyes are like a flame of fire, and the armies of heaven are following him on white horses, and out of his mouth comes a sharp sword which strikes down his enemies, and he will rule, for his name has been written that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. 
And then we'll hear a multitude saying together in a loud voice, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. And she's clothed in fine linen, bright and pure. And the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel says, write this, blessed are those who were invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Brothers and sisters, if you are in Christ this morning, you have been invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. I want to close by going back to arrival. Remember the premise? Our language shapes the way we think the world, the way we see the world. Our language shapes the way we see the world. And as Louise Banks learns this circular language, she begins to think circular. She sees her story all at once. She has memories of the past and the future in her present. And those memories of her future reorient her understanding of the world. If we can hold that picture in Revelation 19 as a memory of our future in the present, when that becomes real to our heart, that memory of your future will reorient your whole world. Christian, that is your destiny. The Lord reigns is your future. It's how your story ends. And that, my friends, is reason to rejoice, even in the midst of darkness. You see, the Lord reigns, reorients our world, and is a reason for the righteous to rejoice. You think about that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, would you teach us to have eyes of faith, and to reorient our lives around the certain future that is ours in Jesus. When you reigning in righteousness and justice will come fully on this earth, and then we will rejoice. Would you teach